Hi, everybody. Um, I totally left all of my notes at home, just so you know. But that's fine, because I'll do what I always do, which is just completely talk out of my ass. Um, and actually, my slides, I, I hate PowerPoint, like, with a passion that I say I, I reserve for, you know, like people who scan the allegory. It's, so all I have are photos in here. There's like maybe two sentences, and that's it. Um, what I'm going to talk about today kind of is my, my journey through the tech industry and into where I am now, which work, is working predominantly exclusively as a social justice writer and speaker. And it is because of my relationship with tech that I actually am where I am today. So I hope you guys are interested in hearing me talk about me, because that's all I'm going to do. <laughs> all right, let me see if I can make this quicker. You can also hit, there you go. There, all right, so this is the beginning. This is me and my brother. And we did not start out the way that many people in Seattle who find themselves in tech start out. We started out really poor. Like, not poor when your friends say, like, I can't afford to go to a movie. Poor, like, we were living in a car, we had no electricity, uh, we had nothing. So we had no tech. In fact, I remember when Super Nintendo came out and we wanted one really bad, my mom went and found us an old Pong console. <laughs> and she was like, it's just as good. It's just as good. <laughs> And we invited our friends over. We're like, no, we got this cool game. And they were like, wow, you guys are so poor. And every, the jig was up. Um, so we really did not know anything about technology. Um, I think I was 14, so this is 94, 95, when my mom got us an Apple II LE computer. Um, so you know, we were always about a decade behind as far as tech goes. Um, but then I got pregnant, had a baby, and I got a husband. And not one of those cool husbands, I got a really bad husband. <laughs> and so I needed to get a job. <laughs> and so I got a job, and I just happened to get one in telecom, which is, I think, pretty normal for a lot of people who need to get a job in Seattle, or at least it was probably 10 years ago. Um, 13 years ago when like AT&T and Singular, all of that good stuff was happening. Um, I started off just in regular customer service and then I started volunteering for projects like testing, things like that. It turned out I had a knack for it. So I moved from testing to actual business analysis, project management, things like that. But still my love had always been politics and this, this will make sense in a second. <laughs> So, like social issues had always been a love of mine, so I decided I was going to go back to college. And this is at Western, so if anybody went to Western, yeah, you, you recognize that statue right away. And <laughs> I went back to school um, to study political science, and I continued to work in tech that whole time. So I supported my son and I um, by working in tech. Uh, so I worked from home doing dev releases, uh, Red Hat, things like that, from my house. Um, well, to the point where people that I was in conference calls with knew my son so well that one time he was asking me for a lollipop, I was on a conference call, and one of the directors in Atlanta shouted out, Malcolm, it is 10 o'clock in the morning, you cannot have a lollipop. <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> so I was going to transition out, kind of use my skills to transition into um, areas I was passionate about, and I had actually um, received an offer from the Gates Foundation uh, to work there, kind of combining my tech skills with my social justice love. Um, but then I, I got pregnant again, and so I was not going to be able to move to Washington, D.C. to begin work at Gates Foundation, which is where this particular program was um, done. So I just focused on finishing school. And I don't know if you can tell that I'm pregnant in that robe. I was like, oh, thank God, everyone looks pregnant in these robes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, my son graduated from kindergarten the day before I got my bachelor's. So he was pretty excited, and he wore his hat and made everyone tell him congratulations as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back into tech, 
and started working and kind of fell into the tech world. Um, first, I started working actually as a T1 provisioner and a switch, de switch technician. So actually, you know, going in, pulling wires, writing out circuits, things like that. It was an interesting environment for me, having spent the last couple of years immersed in the world of academia, political science, to come back into tech, especially landline tech, which is like this, I don't know if anybody here has worked in that. It's a really strange world because it's like a mix of like half Navy guys, because that's really where you learn a lot of things like switch, switch tech stuff and things like that. And then just, you know, well, like the rest of the tech industry kind of mashed together and I did not fit in that industry. But I was very good at it and got promoted like three times within two years. Uh, was working, you know, really hard, doing well, but I was constantly confronted with sexism in the industry, lots of racism in the industry. I remember being asked during an, an orientation for a promotion I had gotten if this was my real hair. Um, I've been asked that so many times. <laughs> Is it a weave? Because I saw that good hair movie and I know what black girls have to go through with your hair. I've been kissed on the elevator by people I don't know. Um, it's a re it's been a really weird environment, and it was kind of one of those things that you just played along. And I actually was I was really happy I had friends, but I noticed that who I was, what I started talking about, who I was talking to changed. You know, my subject matters revolved around tech things all the time. You know, my friends we talked about work when we were hanging out and getting drunk and stuff like that. And I was doing okay. There was me at, at a conference, you know, talking about digital marketing and advertising. Um, but then Trayvon Martin happened. And I, it's really hard, I still struggle to put into words what that meant, what that breaking point was for me. But I was traveling, I was working as a trainer in digital marketing, and I traveled the country basically explaining the internet to old white guys. That was my job. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I was on the road when this happened, and my brother was on the road as a musician. And my son is now 13, and I saw so much of my son in this boy, and I saw so much of my brother um, as well, and I was absolutely heartbroken. But what I noticed, um, turning to the avenues that I was so used to relying on, the internet, um, was the absolute silence that I encountered from my community. Nothing. I mean, and it got to the point where I was begging, especially, too, because I was on the road. So I'm trying to find connection home. And I would say, somebody say something. And the response I would get back was, I don't really feel like this is my place. I don't really feel comfortable. What if someone yells at me if I say something? And it was utterly heartbroken. I've grown up in Seattle. Seattle's been my home. And it was the first time I ever really felt like there was a concrete wall between me and the rest of the community that I lived in. So kind of out of desperation, out of survival, I just started writing. I started writing about what I was feeling because I needed somebody to talk to about it. And it ended up kind of changing my social life. These are my, you know, some groups of people I met who just started listening to what I was saying. I ended up kind of shifting to a whole other social circle. But as I was writing more and speaking more at conferences, talking about police brutality, talking about race, talking about feminism, really just to kind of keep alive after seeing that disparity between, you know, the place I spent most of my day and the rest of my identity. Um, it became really harder to be quiet. I was already known as a loudmouth, and I remember people saying, you know, okay, you know, Joma's great at presentations, and they would bring me out to like impress big clients. But if it was a question about we need someone's opinion, they were like, let's not include Joma in this meeting because she does have opinions. She has a lot of opinions, and you'll know what they are. Um, to the point where actually, I, you know, the last promotion I got in my job before I left the industry, someone called me and she said you're so good at this, you know, you're great at your job. And she's like, you know, and I was worried because when you applied, someone called me and said that you have a very strong personality. I don't see that necessarily as a negative, and I certainly don't think it's something that, had I not been a woman, especially a black woman in the industry, would have ever been used as a detractor 
to describe someone, um, especially in tech. So then all of a sudden I started like showing up on television, which was weird. Um, it was really weird to the point where, I mean, because I, I had, I, I still literally was working in digital advertising. And then I was getting emails from, from CNN and from um, CB, CBS Evening News saying, you want to fly to New York and talk about race in America. And so I would, because I didn't want to ruffle feathers at work, I wouldn't even tell them I left. I <laughs> would fly to New York and like work like I was there and just like start a couple hours later and be like, yeah, no, it's fine. Hey, you know, I've just got a meeting for an hour. And then I would like run, sit in makeup, get on TV, because I knew that none of them ever watched whatever this was. <laughs> I knew there was pretty much no chance. And it, the whole time, only one person ever, and it was a vendor, came in and was like, did I see you on the news? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> totally someone else. Um, I like this photo, too, just because this is the face that I give <laughs> a lot. And I love that they captured this for CBS Evening News. <laughs> It's just me be like, what? <laughs> um, but I, as I was doing this more and more, it, was, it started to kind of bleed into my life. And so I started getting things like people on Facebook going, look, I found a quote of you on Twitter on Tumblr. And it was like this weird inception world where things I tweeted about would end up in Tumblr. And then my friends on Facebook would find it on their Tumblr and put it on my Facebook. And then my friends were like, what are you so mad about, Ijoma? And I'm like, well, this is what I'm talking about all the time. So eventually, I couldn't do it anymore. And it was a weird break where I just had a day where I said, you know, I think today might be the day I quit my job. And I was writing a lot, but I had started to make decisions where I had to turn down writing and speaking assignments because, you know, like my boss was not going to like, he was going to notice eventually that I was like flying out of town or, <laughs> or showing up on the radio in the middle of the day, which I, I totally did. Like, radio, I would go out to my car for like 15 minutes <laughs> and do a radio call, and I'm trying to muffle the noise of traffic so it doesn't sound like I'm in my car and talk about race and social justice. And then I would run in, and my boss would say something like, Ijoma, 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 okay, okay. See, there's this commercial of this like, really ugly dude and I just need you to make fun of him and make an ad for it and I'd be like this is the worst job I've ever had in my life <laughs> and so one day I just I did I just quit my boss sent me another condescending sexist email and my reply was yeah I'll get that done for you also like quit and he was like are you kidding me I said no I'm done I quit and it was really strange because I said goodbye to tech, but at the same time, completely immersed myself in the internet because that's really where you live today if you work in social justice and if you are a writer. So I thought I was like leaving the tech world and instead it was like all I do is technology. In fact, I've completely forgotten how to have face-to-face -face conversations with people. I don't do that anymore. Um, it's really weird sometimes because I'll read something I wrote and I'm like, this is what it sounds like when words come out of people mouths, these things that I wrote. So I am still active uh, on Twitter, um, and it's worked pretty well. And then I also got an opportunity to really take what I had learned from working in tech, working on the internet, and really start to do some good with it, primarily with I Believe You, It's Not Your Fault. Um, this is a website that we're currently redoing, but it started out in Tumblr. And it is a anonymous website for people who have um, survived physical, sexual abuse, problems with um, disability acceptance, fat acceptance, and want to talk about it. And so that's the premise of, I believe you, it's not your fault. Because that's often what people want to hear. And the beauty of the internet is for all of the vile hatred that you can find out there, there's also community that you can build out of anywhere. So we get 
letters like this, uh, probably a dozen a day right now, from young people especially saying, you know, this was my fault, what happened to me was my fault. And to be able to say, no, it wasn't, and have other people respond and go, you know what, that happened to me too. You're not alone. People also get to write their own story. And if they just want their story published, um, it can go out there to reach out to other people and people can get to read it. So what was interesting was, you know, I still get calls from my old friends in tech saying, what's it like to leave the industry? You know, I bet you're so glad to be done with it. Uh, but I wouldn't be where I was without it because I did not understand. I was very insulated from how important it was until I was in an environment that was so adverse to addressing social issues, especially issues that affect the brown communities, the queer communities, um, the disabled communities. Uh, it wasn't until then that I realized how incredibly important it was to not just be a good person, but to have a voice and to get out there and try and change your environment. And I used those tools from that place that was so inhospitable and so hard to live in to make a difference. So I kind of want to talk about this because, you know, I'm 34, I'm not a baby. And this is something that is fairly recent to me. And it's something that's not incredibly hard to do. And everyone in this room has an opportunity to look at their environment and see where those gaps are, see those things that nag in the back of your brain and make that environment a better place for everyone there. And we all have privilege that we can leverage to help those and help dismantle that hierarchy um, in this very structured environment that we all work in. So I think I have just a couple more minutes if anyone has questions, but I don't know what possible. Yes? No, you know, the one thing for me, luckily, oh yeah, so he asked how I deal with jerks on Twitter, and I have a ton of them, and it's actually kind of a weird thing, like a specialty of mine is dealing with online trolls. Um, I kind of have fun with it at this point. They do, because they can really drag you down. Um, the internet works very hard to silence marginalized communities. Um, for me, primarily, it, I always keep in mind the irony that this person is so invested in what I have to say, so wi wired up about it, that they're trying to come up with ways to make me feel a thing. I don't know who they are. And when they go away, I still won't know who they are. So when you think of it that way, who's trolling who? I'm the one like in their brain right now that's got them so incensed that they're like, I'm gonna look up her family history, I'm gonna find, I mean, people have made profiles of my dead grandfather. Um, that's a lot of time to spend thinking about me, like a lot, and it makes, it reminds me that what I'm doing is important, and that these are the types of barriers. It is so important that people are that threatened to take that action, so I kind of have fun with it a lot of times, I kind of be absurd with it, but do whatever you need to do. Also, don't ever let anyone tell you how to handle harassment on the internet. I see a lot of that. I see a lot of people trying to white knight. They come in and go, ignore the trolls. Don't talk to the trolls. Don't do this, especially if you're a woman on the internet. It seems like everyone rushes in to be like, hey, do you need, do you need help? Do you got this? You should just ignore them. It should be fine. I'm like, no, I got this. So you know, don't let people tell you what to do. Don't let people tell you to let things go. Don't let people tell you to get angry when you don't want to get angry. Don't tell, let people tell you to calm down. Don't t let people tell you to ignore, you don't have to ignore anything, ever. In fact, ignore less things. Get mad about more things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be here for the rest of the things. So if you guys want to come up to me later, I'll be here. Thank you for your time.